So Wateropolis is a manufacturer of granular materials. And there are alternatives to the traditional sand and anthracite type products that people are used to in the markets. So somebody will come to us and say, I've got a filter, it's five years old, it's just not performing, it either never did perform where we needed it to be, there's been a regulatory change and we need to lower a limit on something, or we're running into resource constraints, we don't have enough water. Iron is generally easier to remove. You know, you can oxidize iron and then you have a number of choices. Most removals are a little less fussy about which crystal structure it ends up being. I guess the point is that manganese is a complicated mineral and a complicated thing to remove sometimes. If you use a manganese coated material, which, which we make, you can mitigate some of the potential for that pink water. So interesting. So Talk me through some of those other kind of design elements when you're selecting this, you know, your media uh, that people should consider. So a lot of it comes down to what sort of oxidant you want to use. Most common in municipal drinking water is chlorine. If a, a biological component that stays protected. And that, that matters, because you're right. If you get carried away, you can overclean your filter and then you see a decrease in effluent quality. We really end up in places where people are trying to come up with a lower cost or more lower cost or more robust cost. All right, sweet. I'm here with Derek French with Wateropolis. Um, kind of give me the overview. What what is Wateropolis? So Wateropolis is a manufacturer of granular materials, and there are alternatives to the traditional sand and anthracite type products that people are used to in the market space. So we, we really specialize in fixing people's problems. So we try to optimize the process, whether it's energy savings, water savings, um, or if they're having a trouble getting a specific contaminant out of water, that's when they call us. And we most often work with existing infrastructure. So somebody will come to us and say, I've got a filter, it's five years old, it's just not performing. It either never did perform where we needed it to be, there's been a regulatory change and we need to lower a limit on something, or we're running into resource constraints. We don't have enough water or, or we're burning too much power. So that's, that's kind of when our phone rings. Oh. Yeah, when people have really bad problems with their right. filter. If it's easy, anybody can do it. So we pick the material based on the type of vessel it's going in and the quality expectations of the client. I have a question about the iron and manganese. How do you remove it with these filters? Iron, iron is generally easier to remove. You know, you can oxidize iron and then you have a number of choices for filtration. So we have some really robust uh, ceramic materials where you would oxidize the iron and remove it. And those filter medias have no predicted end of life. They literally will run for tens and tens of years and need little to no maintenance. So that's the, that's the really cool thing about iron. It's generally pretty easy to do. And it's about making something that gives you good effluent quality day in, day out, and low waste, uh, low waste volumes. Manganese is a little more difficult. Manganese, you sort of have to, sometimes you have to stand on one foot, pat your head, and wave a magic wand, because manganese can be a little fussy. Um, so we've learned how to optimize products and put a reactive surface on those products. Uh, manganese often needs a catalyst. So you need, a, you need an active surface and the manganese has to react with that surface and then you precipitate it on the media until you can backwash it out. So that's often a little different technology than we would use. That technology can be used for iron as well, but it's really suited for manganese removal. There's about, there's no less than 16 different potential crystal structures that occur when manganese is oxidized. And that crystal structure is pH dependent, temperature dependent, time dependent, so it's not as simple as people right. put it out there to be. Does that mean there's 16 different ways to treat it? Or no. do some get like eight of those? No. Or... It'll, it, most, most removals are a little less fussy about which crystal structure it ends up being. I guess the point is that manganese is a complicated mineral and a complicated thing to remove sometimes. And it is very much influenced. pH is a huge one. Oxidation potential is really important. Um, a lot of people want to treat manganese like iron, and they're just different. You can get iron at a fairly neutral pH with a mild amount of oxidant and get pretty good removal. There are times 
you won't even budge manganese. Like you can throw all that. It, it's much more stubborn to convert to that precipitated component. Some people use permanganate as a way to catalyze that crystal structure. A lot of people don't like permanganate because if you do it wrong, you end up with pink water and nothing gets a consumer hotter than pink water coming out of their tap. So that's so interesting because that's exactly what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. So pink water is a side effect of using permanganate and not having that dosage nailed down. If you use a manganese coated material, which which we make, you can mitigate some of the potential for that pink water. But a lot of people don't want to use permanganate and it's it helps catalyze that crystal structure. So instead, you end up needing a, a filter media with a manganese dioxide coating enough oxidation potential to create that crystal formation. And basically what you're doing is taking manganese from the water, creating a loose crystal structure on the filter media until you backwash, breaking that loose and backwashing it off. Over time, filter medias that take out manganese actually grow in size. They develop a manganese coating that never comes off. The inside of your tanks turn black, the inside of your pipes turn black, and that, that media dimension actually changes over the years. You're describing a problem that's like super hitting the home right now. I just, because they can't figure it out. And so that's interesting. Does it coat, is it react with like ductile iron pipe a lot? Of It'll coat anything. anything. It'll PVC. coat the inside of your pressure vessels. It'll coat inside of PVC. It coats everything. That black, like. That, and that black coating is not a bad thing. It, it actually aids in the removal of dissolved manganese. Oh. I, I have clients that will take an inert ceramic like ours. And when they put it in and they feed permanganate, and eventually the permanganate chemical creates that coating on the media, eventually they can shut the permanganate off because they've basically put an MNO2 coating on the media. Then someday they replace the media, which they probably didn't need to do. And they go, why isn't my system taking out manganese anymore? Well, you've lost that coating. So sometimes we even go into filters and intentionally create that coating to help, to, help, to help, help create a catalytic surface for taking manganese out. So interesting. So talk me through some of those other kind of design elements when you're selecting this, you know, your media uh, that people should consider. So the other, the other it, a lot of it comes down to what sort of oxidant you want to use. Most common in municipal drinking water is chlorine. If you're only using chlorine as an oxidant, you're kind of limited as to what kind of materials you can put in, whether it's for iron or manganese removal. Um, we do get some clients that want to do peroxide or ozone. Yeah. Then you have to think through or air. Air is much less common. There was a day when I was young when air was used for as a potential oxidant, but a lot of these minerals like iron and manganese don't have good kinetic response to air. They don't want to oxidize rapidly. So people moved away from air, but things like peroxide and ozone decompose to air right? They, they turn back to air at some point and they do it in the middle of your filter most often. And when you get a high dissolved oxygen content in your water, you can actually start to get biological growth in your filter. And biological growth can, can if it's done wrong, actually stunt the removal. So we actually add an antimicrobial component through a copper zinc alloy to our media to prevent biological overgrowth because manganese removal requires a catalytic surface. And if that catalytic surface becomes covered in biomass, it's not catalytic anymore. The water is not actually touching it. So in those situations, we have intentionally tried to deter biological growth if we have a chemical that's reverting back to oxygen. We have other applications where we actually want to grow biology, where you can do biological iron and manganese removal. So you you now use, in that situation, you intentionally grow, mic grow microbes, and those microbes digest iron and manganese as part of their me metabolic process. So that's another way to do it. Different way to think different, about it. Different way to tackle it. And in those situations, we want a high surface area. So we actually make uh, expanded clay materials, which have immense surface area, and are a good host superstructure for biological growth. And, and in those situations, particularly in warmer waters where you've got high DOC, some good alkalinity and a modest pH, you can get robust biological growth that ends up consuming the iron and manganese as part of the digestive process of that microbe. And then you start growing microbes in the bed. It starts to add to head loss and periodically you backwash the filter and you knock off that excess 
biological growth. It's usually in the form of some extra polymeric substance, EPS. So it's the, the slimy goo that, that sets up in a filter. Um, and sometimes in those biological processes, you actually have to add nutrients to help. It's counterintuitive, but you would actually add nutrients to help it grow. So you might have DOC and, you, and maybe you need a carbon source or maybe you need phos phosphorus right? Or nitrogen. Those certain things microbes need to be happy. So sometimes you have to nutrient amend. Then you can make a really good biological process for iron or manganese removal. The challenge with doing it biologically is it has a fairly long seeding time. So it takes a while for the filter to acclimate. So you're out of compliance up until the filter grows a robust biological takes host. Time. Kind of get, it takes get time, it. right? Takes, so you have to be patient. You have to have a regulator that allows you to acclimate that biological is that kind of a one-time thing though or is it every time you if you keep it healthy no if you keep it healthy and we use a we use a filter media that has a lot of macroporous structure so when you backwash you still have openings where you can hide active microbial colony in there so if you over back if you can't over backwash or over strip your media there's always um a, a biological component that stays protected and that that matters because you're right if you get carried away you can over clean your filter and then you see a decrease in effluent quality. Co filtration of iron and manganese is probably newer to most people. I mean, when I grew up in a world where if you had bugs growing in a filter, the sky was falling. Correct. And that's, I, I think most people would say that yeah. too. And, and now we're at a place where we've learned in municipal drinking water that biological filtration can be used for all sorts of things like personal care products and hormone and, and, and pharmaceutical, the there's other stuff to get out, but we can use it for iron and manganese. We've used biological filtration on wastewater for years, right? For ammonia to nitrate, nitrate to nitrate, and, and through to nitrogen in, in, a, in, a, in an anoxic zone and, and gas it off. So we've been doing biological and wastewater for years, but bi biological and water has become more popular as well. So, so we got a multiple ways, depending on the application, the flow expectation, um it the water quality right so you have to pick the right technology okay. two questions what well, how did how did i guess the first one would be how do wateropolis get started is oh that's a great question so there was a company in ohio back in the 90s let me start over in the 80s and 90s 3m developed ceramics for use um that ended up going into water filtration company in Ohio bought the patents and started producing ceramics. And those ceramics started going into high rate pressure vessels for surface water, iron and manganese, got involved in a lot of the round one uh, EPA demo arsenic removal projects. Ceramics were very popular in that. And then they exited that ceramic business and basically Wateropolis was formed, picked up the production of the ceramics and carried on. So I've, I've been involved in ceramics and filtration since the early 2000s. So it's not new. It's not, it's not new. It's a it's a little specialized because we really we really end up in places where people are trying to come up with a lower cost or more lower cost or more robust process. The robustness um, is that kind of meaning it needs a tailor made solution. This isn't like a um, like kind of. Well, so, so robustness, I mean, there's robustness of process and then there's robustness of product. We look at ceramics in pressure vessels as robustness of product, meaning we, we have some ceramics that have no predicted end of life. We put a 10 year mechanical warranty on them because they're going to outlive me. Yeah. Um, and in those situations, it also can be a robust process. We, we want to make sure that the process works in a way where the customer gets the same quality they they expect every day with little variance. Nothing upsets an operator more than a non-compliant event. Well, so now gotta, so now we have to do some work. Right. Well, <laughs> sir, we got to <laughs> we got to come to a place where that where the client has they have better things to be doing than monitoring the effluent quality every minute, wondering when a plant's going to go out of compliance. Right. Right. So there's robustness of process we have to look at as well. So. Um, do you have any kind of maybe success stories you could share, recent wins or you don't? Um... Oh, we've, we have actually, we've been doing, uh, working with uh, actually filter manufacturers in the mess in the Midwest, doing a lot of biological ammonia removal in, in places like Iowa, multiple locations in the last two years 
where we're doing high rate gravity filters, growing a biological process for and, and adding uh, dissolved oxygen and taking ammonia uh, out of drinking water. And it's been a tremendous success story. Um, we have iron and manganese removal coast to coast. I mean, we supply not only to municipalities, uh, but we do industrial and one of our biggest segments is consumer products. So many of our many of people walking around the show don't realize that they have our product in their basement on their well at home, filtering iron and manganese out of their well water. So so we're we're in so many different filters in so many different places. It's it's kind of hard to measure. It's kind of hard to miss. So yeah. All right. Well, sweet. Derek. Is that that's it? Huh? Was that? Yeah. That was great.